Hi everyone, I'm Radhika Mittal. I'm doing my PhD in UC Berkeley where I'm advised by Sylvia Ratnasamy and Scott Schenker. And I'm going to talk about our recent work on universal packet scheduling which appeared in NSTA this year. Now there are some of you in the audience who have already suffered through this talk before. So I would like to apologize to you all and uh, I would also like to say that there's good news for you. It's not exactly the same as last time. I've added two lines on SDNs to make it a better fit for the venue. So you have something new to watch out for. Okay. <laughs> Should, should we spot the difference? <laughs> if you want. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, as we all know, scheduling algorithms play a key role in, in any packet switch networks. And so, over the years, our community has developed many different scheduling algorithms, such as first in, first out, fair queuing, virtual clock priority scheduling, etc., etc. And there has been this implicit assumption that we need these many different algorithms to meet many different goals in many different contexts. And all of these scheduling algorithms are implemented in the router hardware. So how do we support these different scheduling algorithms that are needed for different requirements? One option is to go and change all of the router hardware when our requirements change and one can imagine how difficult that would be given the scale of the network. A second option is to implement all of the scheduling algorithms in the hardware but this can be very expensive and what if someone comes up with a new algorithm for a new requirement then we would again need to go and change all of the router hardware. A third option is to have programmable scheduling as advocated in a recent proposal developed in parallel to UPS, but this requires a form of programmable hardware in every router that does not exist yet. And what is driving all of this is the underlying assumption that we need different scheduling algorithms for different requirements. Which leads us to ask this question. With our work, we instead ask a different question. Do we really need different scheduling, scheduling algorithms for different requirements? Or can we instead have a universal packet scheduling algorithm, or what we call a UPS? Whereby a UPS we mean a single scheduling algorithm that can imitate the network-wide output or the final end-to-end -end output produced by any other algorithm. Now the first question that might occur to you is, how can a single algorithm Im imitate all others and that too at a network-wide level? So to understand that, let us look at our network model where we have some input traffic coming in at the network ingress, which traverses the core of the network, where the routers are running some scheduling algorithm, many of which may rely on some header state that can be initialized at the ingress, and the resulting output is, is then seen at the network egress. Now, according to the conventional mindset, the output traffic characteristics at the egress are tied to the scheduling algorithm that is running in the routers. So for different desired output, we would go and run different scheduling algorithms in the router. For example, if our goal is to minimize the mean flow completion time, we would emulate something like shortest job first by running priority scheduling in the routers with the headers carrying priority values depicting the flow size. Similarly, if our goal is fairness, we would go and run fair queuing in the routers and for this we do not need any specific header initialization. But if our goal is weighted fairness, we would run weighted fair queuing in the routers with the headers now carrying the flow weights and so on. However, in our quest for universality, we envision tying the output traffic characteristics solely to the header initialization process with the core running a scheduling algorithm that is completely agnostic of the desired output and it simply makes uniform scheduling decision using the packet header state. So you can think of this header initialization as being analogous to passing different parameter values to a fixed function to get different desired outputs. So the question that we ask now is, is it possible to have a UPS here? And can, and can it actually just rely only on header initialization to get any desired output? Now I'd like to point out here that our model assumes that the network edge is capable of greater processing complexity than the core of the network. And this is in line with the edge code split proposed in, in, proposed in prior SDN-based architectures. And, and uh, basically where the core focuses on like just uh, getting the pack delivering the packet from one point to another, whereas the edge is responsible for the rest of the things. And similarly in our model, like the core is running a fixed algorithm and it's just sort of taking care of delivering the packets, whereas the edge is responsible for making sure that the headers are initialized appropriately to meet the desired objective. Okay, so with this understanding of a model, let us dive into how we formally define and evaluate a UPS. We define a UPS using two viewpoints. The first one is a theoretical viewpoint that I informally mentioned about earlier. And here we call a scheduling algorithm universal if it can replay any given schedule. I'll soon formalize what I mean by a replay and a schedule here. And this theoretical viewpoint provides us with a very clean definition of universality. It allows us to understand its fundamental limitations, which algorithms are flexible enough to be universal and so on. 
but as we'll see later uh, while it is theoretically useful it cannot be applied in practice so a second definition of UPS is from a practical viewpoint where a UPS is simply defined as an algorithm that can achieve different network wide objectives now in this talk I'll focus more on the theoretical viewpoint so for this again consider a network model where we have some uh, some topology with some input load coming in given to us in the form of the packet arrival times of the ingress and we have some arbitrary set of scheduling algorithms running in the core routers many of which may rely on some header initialization which is done at the ingress and the resulting output is then seen at the network egress uh, and uh, so this this uh, output is what is what we represent as op for a packet p and this set of output times is what we call a schedule and the set op gives us the original schedule I would like to point out that we allow a very broad view of universal, a very broad view of scheduling algorithms when creating this original schedule. For example, we can have two different routers running two different algorithms. They may rely on arbitrary state, or may they even, or they may even consult an oracle. The only requirement we have from the original schedule is that the final output times must be viable, in the sense that there must be some way to schedule the incoming packets in the routers such that we get the the resulting output times. We then try to replay this original schedule given to us in the form of the output times OP by using the same topology and the same input load and we also assume that every packet follows the same path in the original schedule and in the replay. But we now run a candidate UPS in the core and we initialize the header for every packet at the ingress using the output times from the original schedule. And this gives us a new set of output times at the egress that we denote as O prime P for a packet P. We say that the replay is successful if for every packet P, O prime P is less than or equal to OP. However, we add some pragmatic constraints on what the header initialization process and the UPS can use. The first constraint is that when initializing the header for a packet P, the ingress router can only use the output time and the path information for that packet P and it should remain completely oblivious to the rest of the packets in the network. And the second constraint is that in making its scheduling decision, the UPS can only use some uh, so the packet header state and some static information pertaining to the network topology. By enabling these constraints, the key source of impracticality that remains in our model is the knowledge of the output times OP at the ingress. And we get rid of this impracticality with a practical viewpoint that I'll be discussing later. And we term this constraint model as black box initialization. So with this understanding of a model, let us look at some of our basic results. Uh, we can show that we can always have a UPS under the omniscient initialization condition, where we allow the header initialization process to use extensive knowledge about when every packet was scheduled at every hop in the original schedule. But this is not a very surprising result. Interestingly, we can also produce a counter example that shows that we can never have a perfect replay under the black box initialization condition I'd mentioned before, where only the final output times at the egress are used to initialize the packet headers. Now with these extreme results, we then try to explore how close we can get to a UPS in the black box model. Through our theoretical analysis, we find that the difficulty of replay is determined by the number of congestion points that a packet sees in the network, where a congestion point is defined as a router where a packet can wait. We can show that while there exists a scheduling algorithm that can replay all schedules with up to two congestion points per packet, we can prove that no scheduling algorithm can replay all schedules that have three congestion points per packet or more. So this gives us an upper bound in terms of the number of congestion points that a scheduling algorithm can handle. So the next question is, can we achieve this upper bound? And the answer is yes. The classical least slack time first algorithm can indeed achieve this upper bound. So what is LSTF? In LSTF, we initialize the header of, the, of every packet with a slack value that indicates the maximum possible queuing delay that the packet is willing to tolerate in the network. So for the purpose of replay, the slack value would be initialized as the queuing delay that the packet saw in the original schedule. Then as the name suggests, the router schedules the packet with the packet with the least slack time first and it additionally updates the slack of every packet that it is scheduling by subtracting the duration of time for which the packet waits at the router. We can prove that LSTF can replay all schedules with two congestion points per packet and like any other algorithm, it can fail to replay schedules that have three or more congestion points per packet. And it's not that any other algorithm is capable of achieving this upper bound. For example, simple priority scheduling can only replace schedules with one congestion point per packet and can fail beyond that. 
Okay, so these theoretical results establish that LSTF is as close to universal as any algorithm can get, but they do, they do not give us any concrete measurement of this closeness to universality. So for this, we do some empirical experiments by doing LSTF replay using NS2 simulations, and we study how close LSTF is to being universal under realistic settings. And we find that for most cases, a less than 3% packets miss their target output times in an LSTF replay. And more importantly, for most cases, less than 0.1% packets miss their targets by more than one transmission time. So this shows that even though LSTF is not perfectly universal in the most theoretical sense, it is indeed very, very close to universality under realistic conditions. Now, as I mentioned before, our theoretical viewpoint is not practical as it requires the knowledge of the output times from an original schedule, and which is not available in practice. And also, we don't care about replaying schedules in practice. What we care about is achieving different objectives. So with a practical viewpoint, we look at how LSTF can be used in practice to achieve different objectives. And the key difference between the two viewpoints lies in how we assign the slacks. Rather than using some original output times, we now look at the network-wide objective that we want to achieve, and we come up with certain heuristics to assign the slack to achieve that objective. We look at three popular objective functions for this purpose, minimizing tail, pack, tail packet delays, minimizing mean flow completion time, and fairness. And our results show that LSTF performs comparable to the state of the art for each of them. And we also show how LSTF can facilitate active queue management from the edge of the network. I do not have time to go into the details of these results today, but you can find these details in our, in our NSDI paper. So to summarize, in this work, we discuss universality of packet scheduling using two viewpoints, theoretical and practical. Our theoretical results show that while there is no UPS under the pragmatic black box initialization model, the classical least slack time first algorithm comes as close to being a universal as any algorithm can get. And empirically, LSTF is very close to universality under realistic conditions. We then show how LSTF can be used in practice to achieve a variety of network-wide objectives. Our work therefore implies that we might not need many different or new scheduling and queue management algorithms, and we can instead just use LSTF with varying slack initializations. But there are still some interesting open questions left. So we showed that uh, uh, LSTF can all we show that we can always achieve universality under the omniscient initialization model and that we can never achieve universality under the black box initialization model. So what is the least amount of information that is needed to achieve universality? Second, can we come up with any tractable bounds on the degree of lateness with LSTF when there are three or more congestion points? And finally, can we formally define the scope of using LSTF in practice? In other words, is there like a class of objectives that can be achieved with LSTF and what can't, etc.? So I'd like to conclude. I'd like to thank you all and I'm happy to take questions. Our code is available online. Yeah. Hopefully this is a simple one. You said that the you were going to restrict yourself to looking at scheduling disciplines that had access to information about the packet's path, uh, the, the desired uh, output time, and certain static information. Yes. Well, can, what about like the, the current queue size at the router? Is that considered static information, or is, are you not allowed to look at the queue size at the router in making a scheduling decision? So, uh, LSTF does not really look at that, and our non-existence proof would sort of not be affected by that. So, but if someone sort of comes up with an algorithm that says that oh, we look at the current queue size. You'd be and okay with that? Yeah, I should be okay with that. I mean, it's not a very hard thing to do for routers, I think. So, uh, another question I have is, um, so uh, unlike the question of finding paths where oblivious routing has been shown to be competitive theoretically and even better in practice, hmm. there are examples where oblivious scheduling does much worse than scheduling that can look at every packet <laughs> and, and make arbitrary decisions mm -hmm. about how packets are prioritized separately at every individual switch. Um, I guess it would be interesting to know if there's a spectrum of things you might consider or not consider between obliviousness and sort of full global knowledge. Yeah, that is sort of the first open question I had. And like, if you actually have any pointers on that, I'll be happy to take a look. And yeah, it would be interesting to find that out. You're right. So actually, 
maybe this is open ended so one question i have is like so why lstf so why did you pick lstf so what's the insight behind why lstf works and so is it just a question of like putting like arbitrary labels in these packets or is it something about the slack semantics that yeah. you know? so uh, one thing about lstf that we realized on the way was like it's sort of this ability to remember the history in some sense like with lstf basically like if i have spent some amount of queuing at one router i subtract that from the total amount i'm allowed to do that and then when i move sort of when i pass that information along to the second router i mean that helps so that is the key difference between simple priority scheduling and lstf so initially i was trying to explore like if priority scheduling can get us far enough and then i realized that no we need need to have some notion of that history so there is this another and earliest deadline first based approach that we can do instead of lstf like uh, i have proof in my paper that shows that it's equ equivalent to using lstf but that uses some uh, some state and some additional state in the routers but yeah i can discuss more about that offline if you like to yeah yes so you uh, so measure one measure you look at is the number of congestion points. Right. Uh, but it's possible that there might be some other metrics that might better decide under what conditions you can have universality and you can. Yeah. So this this seemed like a very natural metric for us when we were comparing different schemes. But yes, like if I'd be open to like less, uh, like sort of knowing more metrics that we can look at, and if you have any ideas, yeah, I would be happy to chat on along those lines. Yeah.